No, it wasn't <coughs> investing um, and not getting a return. All of that consolidation uh, gave quite a big return uh, as a project, actually. And similarly in the US, where we looked at uh, what we call a line strategy, looking at our overall footprint and aggressively looking at that, which meant some plant closures, et cetera, but also um, we looked at uh, and, and put in place uh, segmenting our, our, um, our um, lines there. So, you know, ones that do the big runners, ones that do the innovation, et cetera, et cetera, uh, which has created huge amounts of flexibility, responsiveness, and indeed cost savings. So again, we're talking here about what supply chain can do for a business. Uh, and here are some examples uh, that's on the cost one. Um, performance. I suppose the one thing that the new CEO has brought in is a performance culture. And in many ways, uh, we had it kind of easy, really, with big margins. Uh, people like the products. And, you know, <laughs> things happen. It turned up. And indeed, also then, um, uh, we were very aggressive in terms of building the company. So a lot of the sort of inefficiency and in performance was hidden through acquisitions. So you buy another big company, you buy Seagram's, and sure, everybody's focused on that, and look at our NSV growth. In the meantime, are you really, really efficient uh, in terms of what you're actually doing, you know, back of the ranch? Well, everybody's focusing on acquisitions and all the rest of it. He's changed that tack. In fact, we're not doing as many acquisitions now either. Um, so examples of that uh, also roll into... Um, into, into uh, supply chain. So I mentioned that each market is separate. So we've established a performance framework, 16 KPIs every month. The markets are ranked on, uh, based on those uh, 16 KPIs. Every month, the supply chain director has, um, uh, everyone, get all 21 of them get on a call with the um, president of supply who's functional. Now remember, he doesn't manage these guys. They're managed by the market, uh, GM. Uh, but, you know, he still has got some kind of influence. Uh, and, you know, we rank them, so top, bottom, based on absolute performance against the 16 KPIs and performance of each against their plan for those KPIs. So there's two tables there. What it does is it creates a performance um, kind of uh, competitive focus, uh, but it also identifies who is... Um, Good, so we can share best practice, and they're not all about looking at the tables. These calls, you know, from Nigeria was up, or the US was up, or whatever, they would come on and talk about what they did to, um, to make that difference. So that's an example of that sort of uh, very simple, but very effective uh, performance type uh, arrangement that's in place. Um, one of the themes that's going through the whole organization now is standardization and codification. How do we do stuff? And the idea is, if you do it one way, everywhere, then at least you eventually figure out that that's the way you do it and you become good at it, and it'll free up time for you to do all the value-adding stuff. Right? It's kind of a Toyota type thing, really. You know, so every Toyota factory is exactly the same. They know what to do. Um, so right down to now, where in the different processes, plant, so plan, source, make, move, uh, we're probably in move a bit more advanced. Um, probably next up is in move, came out of that program, where we define our process, define what the secondary KPIs are. There's two for move on that performance framework, but there's about 200 actually underneath all of that. Defining, you know, what the performance management process is every day. So what's the daily meeting for a, a move? What's the weekly meeting? What's the monthly BPM? Standardizing that across the world. Um, absolute pain in the arse to try and get it in because people don't want to do it. It's, it's, not, it's not the same. Our market is different. This, that, and all the other. But actually, again, with sort of discipline and will, you can actually get this in and uh, markets actually see the benefit of it. Um, so that's what's going on there. And I talked about the structure. I mean, the reason behind it, and you can talk about centralized or decentralized structures, the fundamental reason by putting a market-driven structure in place was to give, one, responsibility for the performance of each market, and two, uh, the, the responsiveness for each market to be able to do stuff as they see it um, as being needed, and not having to grind through the whole regional and, 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 and global um, structures as would have been uh, expressed in the past. Um, now, and that's, a, that's okay, 
but obviously what we do is we have got that center of excellence I talked about to make sure that standards, strategies, initiatives, etc., are also uh, put in place so that people don't go off doing daft things. Um, and that has been actually quite effective because when I talked about supply chains being uh, kind of ranked, you know, markets are ranked now as well. It isn't the region of, you know, Letam is doing well. You know, it's Brazil is doing well and Chile isn't. <laughs> you know, uh, and that's quite flagged up. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess you get the sense of it all. Um, innovation. 15% uh, of our NSV is, is driven by products that are less than five years old. Now, that's quite a big deal for uh, companies like Diage. You've got big, iconic brands that you shouldn't mess with because you mess with them, people get fed up with them, and the whole thing falls down. But there, has, there is an even greater focus on innovation within the company, and 50% of our NSV growth is from new products every year. Um, and we've begun to rethink some of the, the way in which we approach it. There's lots of innovation. I just picked out a few of them. Uh, so, for example, you know, it's starting to rethink um, um, Scotch whiskey. So, if any connoisseurs of Scotch whiskey are around, single grain whiskey is kind of a dead kind of an area that people didn't kind of think about too much. So, we created this sort of influencer-led approach to try and revitalise that sector, uh, with led by David Beckham with some fancy packaging and all of the rest of it, really good liquid, and the whole thing has rocketed, it's taken off. Um, so again, supply, this didn't come necessarily through um, just a marketing idea. Um, it came from a joint working with supply, and of course supply had to come up the liquid and come up the packaging. Um, this origin thing in Africa is absolutely fascinating. It's a, a real sleepy um, uh, category called bitters. Uh, Anybody travel in Africa to understand bitters, people uh, think about them as medicinal purposes and all of that sort of stuff. Um, taking local herbs, etc. So, kind of reimagined that and uh, started off with an RTD and then the spirit, and the whole thing has exploded. Um, it's uh, right across Africa now, we're actually bringing it into other parts of, uh, of, uh, of the world. So, it's our biggest actually innovation within uh, Diageo totally. And then you do innovation doesn't just come about you got it, uh, in kind of product innovation. Uh, we also bring it off into other areas. An example of that is in manufacturing, um, where we developed um, what we call the cubes, which are basically containers, but within them, they are portable um, spirit um, blending and packaging plants, bottling plants. So particularly in emerging markets where a lot of people are looking to aspire to drink kind of aspirational drinks, i.e. spirits, not beer. Um, you can get in there early. Um, so all you need is basically water and electricity. Um, and you it's a bit more than that, but that's roughly what you need. Uh, you can plant it and uh, stick it in. We started in Ghana, and we've now got it in six markets across the world. So it's just an innovative way of thinking about how you do stuff. And it's not just product innovation. Uh, last but not least, um, shouldn't forget people. Um, there was some reimagining as well of how we run our people processes. Uh, I suppose a lot of our time and people were <laughs> actually, how do we reduce the number of people? Uh, we've kind of changed that now a little bit because uh, we've got about the right size. And uh, a lot of new processes put in. One of them, one of the ones that were, was quite uh, important was, it's called multi-year talent planning, but to a certain level within the organization, uh, everybody now has got um, kind of um, a review and there's a whole database that's visible to, ev to a lot of people in the organization so uh, we can actually plan our talent and plan our uh, the talent that's needed uh, proactively rather than in the past. So this is on a system that's available globally whereas in the past you know you never knew, quite knew who was working in America, you never quite knew who was working in Asia, you never quite knew who was working elsewhere. So a real big thinking about how can we get our processes right and people <coughs> to, um, to drive um, ongoing improvement. Environment and quality, big issue and concern and focus for us. Uh, uh, environment, we use a lot of water in our processes. We operate in a lot of water stressed areas. So, you know, we do churn out quite a bit of CO2, uh, not, as many, not as much as many other industries, but a lot of focus on that. Uh, and you can see there on the slide, if you can read it, a lot of recognition for some of the things that we've done 